we have the fall of Mariupol. Expected for some time, it should be should be said. And equally, it doesn't alter the the narrative which is taking root now how, of how the war has rather swung away from Russia and towards Ukraine. Well, I, that's absolutely right. And just keeping your focus on the southern flank, as it were, um, with the final fall of Mariupol, more or less, uh, Russia has achieved its strategic objective of creating a corridor from Crimea through Mariupol, through the Donbass, and into Russia itself, which was one of its war aims. Of course, the effect of Ukrainian forces holding out in Mariupol for the 80 odd days that they have uh, has very much constrained what the Russians have been able to do. It's tied down a lot of Russian combat power, which has been beneficial to the Ukrainians elsewhere. And just as a side issue, and a very important side issue, I am not alone in worrying hugely about the safety of those Ukrainian fighters who are now being extracted from the uh, Alostor Stoll uh, steelworks. Yes. Uh, when the Russians say that they will be subject to international law, I'm afraid that's a code that some of these will be put through a kangaroo-type trials with, uh, I don't know what consequences. That's very disagreeable. Um, more widely, uh, we know that the northern uh, flank has collapsed, uh, even Kharkiv they've had to withdraw from. So the focus for Russia is on their uh, central region, uh, pushing uh, west from, or into the Donbass, and ideally through the Donbass, where they continue to make some progress, but pretty slow progress, pretty heavy progress, with Ukrainians again showing uh, their mastery of the battlefield. Yes, I'm interested in your take then as a as a, a former army commander and, and a strategist on the on the question of these Ukrainian prisoners and where they're being taken and how they're going to be treated. The, the Russian legislature, it seems, are considering the idea of a new law that would stop them being exchanged under the, the familiar uh, prisoner exchange system. There, there are voices in the Russian media talking of executing these prisoners. I just wonder, looking at it from, from another angle, that sort of mistreatment of Ukrainian Ukrainian prisoners of war, it could surely be counterproductive from Russia's point of view in a number of different ways. It could stiffen Ukraine's fighting spirit. It would certainly turn world opinion further against Russia. Well, yeah, John, you're absolutely right about all of those things. I think the problem is, is that the Azov Regiment and others that have been fighting uh, in Mariupol are those that have been identified previously as being fairly nationalistic and, and fairly right-wing. Indeed, there have been some Nazi-type um, insignia which has been associated with them, which places them in a very difficult position. And given the stated warning of the Russians at the start of denazification, I'm afraid these fighters from Ukraine who have fought valiantly for an extended period of time have now played themselves into a very difficult situation. Yes. And, you, and the Russians may well do something which they will regard as legal, but most of us would regard as out, outrageous. I'm afraid our hearts in our mouths is to see what the fate of those brave soldiers is going to be. Indeed, 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 sir. Uh, now, uh, on another on another topic, George Robertson, Lord, Lord Robertson, who was a former Secretary General of NATO, he has been saying uh, just in the last day or so that we should be wary of pro provoking... Putin, who he describes as being very thin-skinned and driven by a, a messianic, messianic view of his role in, in Russia's future. But that sort of sensitivity to a thin-skinned, messianic Putin, uh, Lord Danik, what does that mean in terms of the conduct of the war and, for that matter, the surrounding diplomacy? Well, I, I know what George is getting at. And, in fact, I was talking with George um, only a couple of hours ago as we walked into the House of Lords together. Um, and he's right in one respect, in that Putin is probably, and George knows him tolerably well, a fairly thin-skinned person who takes criticism very personally. But um, Putin is actually running short of options and ideas at the present moment. The conventional combat power of the Russian military is all but exhausted at the present moment. Now, I know the question could then move on, but what if he was to use chemical weapons or what if he was to use nuclear weapons? And of course, those are big and frightening questions. But of course, as far as the nuclear issue is concerned, it is not just down to Vladimir Putin to decide to push the button. Even in the Russian nuclear firing chain, there are a number of people that need to agree that this is the right thing to do. And although Putin might think it's the right thing to do, it may be that others in the firing chain don't agree or are not of that opinion. Yes. So I think although George may say that we've got to be careful not to upset Vladimir Putin too much, I think, frankly, we can afford to upset him because I don't think he's got as many options now as he had in the past. 
Ukraine needs to keep the pressure on him. We need to keep supporting Ukraine with all the weaponry and ammunition that we can afford.